Yes, yeah, so I'm Stuart. I'm a developer with ThoughtWorks, mainly uh, developing mobile apps. So I'm up to my elbows trying to build for this future that we all see coming, and we want to talk a little bit about the, some of the problems we're seeing and, and possible solutions for that. Yeah, hi, and I'm uh, Johnny Leroy. Um, I'm living in America at the moment. I'm heading up our technology team on the West Coast in San Francisco. Uh, but I'm originally from the UK. Um, so we couldn't work out which would be more annoying for you guys, having a POM or a Yank coming to tell you you're doing it all wrong. So we thought we'd uh, um, cover our bases and give you both in one package. Um, so, so I wonder if you've heard the phrase that um, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Well, for me, one of the benefits of living in the West Coast of America is some of that uneven distribution is there. So um, I had my first confirmed sighting in the wild of Google Glass um, in my local grocery store two weeks ago. Uh, and my initial worries about covert surveillance went out the window because everyone in the store was looking around going, what's he got on his head? Um, <laughs> and the guy was looking a little bit embarrassed. Um, but for me, the interesting point here is there's new technology, but we don't actually know how it's going to pan out. Um, is this going to be the dawn of a new age of immersive, um, heads up, um, interfaces with augmented reality? What's Apple going to do? Are they going to come up one step closer to the optical nerve and have the eyeball? Um, see? Um, <laughs> um, we, we don't know, and that's the big challenge we're looking at. You know, is this going to be a beautiful new future, or is it going to be what someone described as um, a segue through your face? Um, so that's the challenge we're looking at. Lots of new technology. Um, is, is it going to pan out? Um, what, what should we bet on? Um, so I just want to look at uh, the landscape. So back in the good old days, we had customers, consumers who had needs and money, and businesses who have good ideas. Um, and back in the good old days, there was a simple, single digital channel for trying to um, extract their money um, by using our good ideas. Um, and the, what we're talking about now is that that single screen, that single interface, um, has actually been shattered. Um, Where's my shattering? There we go. Um, and what we're looking at now is a new ecosystem with all these different devices, all these different potential interfaces, um, and massive complexity about how, as a business, we can get our ideas to the consumers um, and still extract them, um, their money. Luckily, everything's easier now because we've got the cloud. That makes everything easier, as I'm sure you all know. So the, the bad news in this is that you, users want to interact with your business through all of these channels, not through a single channel. And that seems bad, but the good news is that the, your users want to interact with you through all of these channels. The actual size of the opportunity and, and the new opportunities to interact and, and to gain that customer base are actually greater than they've ever been before. And the challenge is that if you don't service those needs, other people will, and, and you're, you're liable to be disrupted. So there really is the challenge there that while the customers want that, we really have to meet that need before someone else comes and does that. Yeah, there's really a carrot and a stick there. And we're still trying to work out how to make the most of all these different channels, um, all these different platforms, um, all these different devices to use our good ideas to um, carry on uh, um, earning money from our consumers. So the, the natural response to this is that, that there's so much uncertainty, we can only have a short-term strategy. So even um, from Horace's presentation, the, they have amazing amounts of data predicting what might happen in the future but it really is very uncertain. So it is hard to have a long-term strategy. At the same time, we think there are things that you can start to do now and things to start to adapt for that future. They're not solid technical solutions. You know, you should move everything from Flash to onto an iPad in iOS, and that's your five-year strategy. It's not at that kind of level of detail because we don't have that certainty for technology landscape. In the short term, obviously, some of those things are very important, but the long term, we're going to be talking more about that kind of cultural and organizational change that allows you to thrive in that future. Yeah. And so we're going to try to give you some ideas about how to avoid just sticking your head in the sand and saying, I'll look at what's just in front of me. Um, so a brief summary of some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, first up, we're going to look at how to be a good ecosystem player. Because if we look back to this new landscape, um, there are many different players there, many different devices. You may well not own the relationship all the way up to the glass, all the way up to the consumer. In, so, in some channels you will, but in other channels, like in car or some of these heads-up displays or through Siri or voice, there's likely to be someone else who's mediating that relationship, another commercial entity. So you've got to play nicely with them. So there's this being a good ecosystem player we'll talk about. Um, also how to set your organization and your technology up for evolution. 
because the future is changing and we've got to evolve with it. Um, and then finally, how to have empathy. Empathy for both your customers and your end users and the context they're in, um, and also actually for your internal teams that are trying to adapt and find this path forwards. Um, and in case you're wondering who is this crazy Californian hippie uh, who's bringing out all these nice ideas, um, we're also going to sort of focus on some pragmatic stuff about how to follow the money um, and really sort of drive your strategy that way. So um, we think the best way to try to drive your strategy is to look a little way out into the future, to say wh where's everything going, have a look at what the long-term picture looks like, and then from that we can reverse back into what a short-term strategy might look like. Um, so first up, I started talking about how to be an ecosystem player. Um, and there's a few pieces um, in here. Um, I just mentioned that there's, um, there's all these different devices you've got to look at. Um, and you've got to work out how to get your services in, into these different channels and how to play with different commercial entities. If we take, for example, what's happening in car, um, that's a very new area of how to bring um, entertainment and information. One of my least favorite terms is info, infotainment, in-car infotainment. But there's still people are taking their first steps in that direction, and they're trying to work out how to do that safely without um, killing the driver. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of interface things to think through. But we haven't yet worked out what the commercial models are or what the technology platforms are. Different people are taking different approaches, and that hasn't yet come together. So we've got to work out how to play in that, um, in that system. Yep. And when we're talking about mobile development and dealing with this future, we like to use this tip of the iceberg analogy, that, that the solution for mobile and, and for the future in general is not to pump out a little shiny iPhone app. That, that may be part of the solution in the short term, but actually to build a great mobile experience and, and to build that capability for users to be able to interact with your company through a variety of different channels, actually the bulk of the work is under the waterline that no one sees. It's the, um, the stuff that Scott was talking about earlier about how most of the data is actually computers talking to computers these days. And unfortunately, a lot of existing back-end services and products that we all have uh, in these large enterprises aren't well suited to mobile. The, the data formats, the way that they communicate, uh, unfortunately, aren't well suited. Um, but fortunately, it's, it's easier to spin up new services and, and deploy them and get them out there to the public than it's ever been. The, the, the cloud on that picture and, and is kind of tongue-in-cheek, joking that that's, that's the solution and it's going to solve everything, because obviously, it's, it's very difficult. But the evolution of the cloud and that whole idea of, of getting things out there quickly um, is actually a, a big part of the solution. And without that, we wouldn't be able to thrive in this future. So what we want to do is, as we go forward, instead of having one large system on the back end, we think that once there's a variety of front ends, whether it's the, something like Google Glass or, or in-car headsets, and at the moment, mobile apps are, are a huge part of it, that one large system is not going to uh, solve all your needs on the back end. And there's a few steps that you should start moving towards in the long term to deal with this future. And the first one we want to deal with is this idea of separation of presentation and logic. So the way that uh, the customers are interacting with you, different devices, different screens, different contexts. And the way that you actually represent that data and the way that you interact with it is different in all those contexts. So this idea that traditionally we have uh, the way that you access data and your real, the logic of your business is really tied into how it's presented and we need to start extracting that. And that's something that we've been talking about for a while in the software industry, um, but it's becoming more and more prevalent in this future. So uh, just for an example of some stuff that I worked on a couple of years ago was the way that you, if you're looking for real estate properties, if you're on a website, it's all about the kind of search and find and labeling. But when you're on an iPad, it's all about having big, shiny photos and being able to sit on the couch and show your partner. And once you're out there on your phone, it's all about where are the houses, when are the open for inspections, how do I get in touch with the agent? So the, the core logic underneath that and the business rules are actually the same, but the way it's presented and the interaction is very different. So you have to start separating that. And that's, that's a long-term strategy. You can't just draw a line and tease them apart. It, it's a, a complicated technical process. And the other thing we want to start doing on the back end is, is moving towards this idea of small stitchable services, moving away from one monolithic back end and having smaller slices, more dedicated, that are focused towards specific customer needs and specific screens and devices. And, and through doing this, they become 
quicker to develop and much easier to evolve and change so that you can actually have a, a better opportunity when new devices, new opportunities come along, that you can actually respond to that and get solutions out there quickly in the market. Yeah, and um, one thing that's worth saying about that, looking back to the ecosystem, um, in some situations, you may bring all the pieces to bear. You may own the complete relationship. So you're worrying about um, user management and your search and fulfillment and all these other pieces. Um, when you're feeding into someone else's ecosystem, they may bring some of those pieces. They may handle security and users for you. They may handle um, fulfillment and, and some other pieces and um, mapping and location. So you need to tease apart your services so you can recombine them either for your own different um, channels or to feed into some of these other bigger services. One of the places where we're really seeing this challenge of how do you break down large systems is this idea of content management systems are also going to need to evolve to deal with multiple screens and from many services. So traditionally content management solutions have been that big product that you buy off the shelf and they often deal with uh, content at a quite coarse granularity and kind of at the page level. And if you're starting to grab small pieces of content and you have these small services that aggregate it together differently for a small mobile device versus a tablet versus you know, a heads-up display in the car, it's actually, we're going to have to move away from traditional approaches to content management and become much more fine-grained in the way that we deal with content. And actually, yeah, there's um, a company we've been dealing with up near Seattle. Um, and they, um, not that one. Um, <laughs> um, and they, um, they provide intelligent virtual assistants. There's these little sort of um, chat to someone, um, an automated person, to take pressure off your call center, to, um, to, to reduce the amount of inbound calls to your call center. Um, and we've been having them move that product that they do on the web for various airlines, healthcare companies, even the US Army. We've been having them move that um, to mobile. Um, and there they're using voice and trying to push this conversational interface that we see with lots of new different platforms is this, these natural interfaces. And as you're asking a question to this, to this device, it goes off, finds the information, and tries to feed that back into the conversation. And what they're noticing, there's lots of challenges around voice and getting that on mobile. But some of their bigger challenges are how to integrate with an airline's content management system or their knowledge base, and how to pull out small chunks that you can feed into a conversation. Um, and that's really the challenge we're talking about here. And so while this is a long-term strategy, there's things, those decisions that you can start making now to move towards this. And a major part of that is choosing tools that play well with others. So traditionally having this kind of boxed environment inside your enterprise and, and, and treating everything as an internal thing, unfortunately everything's public now. As soon as you're going over mobile networks, you have lots of public-facing things. And if you want to be able to deal with uh, technology in, in small chunks and, and compose things together, you need to have tools that play well with others. And so as a developer, that often means having a good API so that you can actually start to automate and drive and build tools on top of the tools that you buy. And the large proprietary integration tools are not the solution for this. The, the, the most widespread collaborative technology in the world is the web, and, and I think the dominance of that is only going to continue. So we need to start investing in even our internal tools communicating over the same technologies that we expect to go over public mobile networks as well. And talking about tools that play well with others, it's understanding how these things fit into your in internal ecosystem. So we um, had a project with, um, with Barnes & Noble, with Nook, um, their, um, their device arm that creates e-readers and, um, and tablets. Um, and they asked us, we need to um, revamp and internationalize our e-commerce platform. We need to go live in three months. So we were like, OK, um, we can do that. Um, and day one, they said, oh, we haven't yet chosen our content management system. Um, we're still in vendor negotiations and contract negotiations. So we'd been around the block a few times. We kind of saw a problem there. Um, so um, we set ourselves up because we knew we had this tight three-month um, three deadline. We followed the advice of keep our architecture simple. But there's a second piece of advice of keep it simple but not stupid. So, um, so that's worth following. Um, so, so we knew that the content management system was going to come in. So we created a space for it and put in our fake content management system that meant we could start moving. It was a super simple implementation. Just used a file system, but um, the production people could create the content and we could put it out on the site. Strangely enough, that's what we went live with um, in the UK. And once they finally got their vendor selection and contracts done and the content management team um, came up to speed, we could gradually start um, um, integrating that over time. But for me, the interesting part of that story is that we carved out the space that we thought that system should take in our overall architecture. Because um, if um, the content management vendor had been given um, their druthers, they would have owned everything from 
formatting to delivery to back-end creation of content and um, workflow for sign-off. Whereas, because we could constrain it to, to play um, its right suitable place in that architecture, um, it became a much better player inside our ecosystem. We could have the right sort of separation of concerns there. Um, and this then leads on to um, another point where we're looking out um, further into the future. Um, right now, um, from Horace's talk, it's fairly clear that you can do pretty well by um, focusing on Apple and on, um, and on Android. Um, but when you look out further, we don't know, will Apple still be a dominant player five, ten years out? Um, if five, ten years ago you focused predominantly on a Windows market or did a lot of flash development, you're probably now sort of rethinking that strategy now. So in the short term, keep an eye to the monopolies, but longer term, look for open technologies that are likely to last longer and likely to have broader adoption. So um, we talk about favoring open technologies, but having some short-term pragmatism about um, where the monopoly stands right now. Um, so this brings us on to the thought of, you've got to play in this future ecosystem, but we don't know what it's going to look like. So you've got to get ready um, to evolve um, towards, that, um, towards that new future. And, and part of that is, if you're looking towards the future, it's not about stopping everything and just trying to build all this kind of base and build a platform so you're ready for the future. You have to start experimenting now and evolve as you go. And just a couple of comments on this culture of evolution. As you move towards this idea of designing and discovering products as you go, you really need to start embedding design uh, inside your teams. So we, we see a lot of IT organisations where the the design and product arm of the business is separate to the actual delivery part of the business. And I really don't see this as a sustainable model with the uncertainty that we're seeing where it's not about just saying this is the product and trying to do this agile stuff to move towards a kind of line on a graph. We actually don't know what the solution is and the designers need to be uh, integrated uh, within the teams. And this is really a, an organizational response more than a technical response. Um, and in a similar vein, um, you've got a start working out how to measure and adapt. Um, and for me, there's a couple of sides to this. There's getting designers and user experience researchers involved who can actually go and talk to your customers, talk to them in context, see how they're using their devices as they're on the bus. But also um, have to look at how to get analytics, real data, into your process. Um, so you can measure what's happening um, and learn and adapt based on that. Um, there, there are talks later this afternoon going into more detail on um, analytics and how to be adaptive. So we've had a brief look at um, where the future is going and some ideas for that. Um, we now want to sort of scroll back to um, what can we do in the short term to set ourselves up uh, for, for a shorter term strategy. Yeah, and we are going to talk about apps a little bit here. So although we think that apps are not the end state of the mobile market and, and looking even five years down the track, it might not be this idea of pulling out a phone with an app and pulling down data. It's going to be much more interactive with all the, the devices around you. They are a, a current major part of the market and something that we need to address and something that a lot of companies are struggling with about how do you address these multiple pl platforms and getting good mobile um, applications, whether it's on the web or it, in the app store out there. Yeah. So um, first up, so looking right now, there's some basics of nuts and bolts to get right, um, just to set yourself up. Um, so the first one I want to look at is security. Um, this is one that's easy to forget. Um, and um, organizationally, um, things are changing. You can no longer rely on the fact that people are on your premises using your hardware inside your firewall. Like it or not, your perimeter is now porous. People are bringing in their devices, they're installing Dropbox, they're out and about, they're trying to work everywhere. Um, this is great because you can get them to work late at night, but it's also a challenge because um, there's security concerns. So just having perimeter defense is, is no longer enough. Um, and the moment you have some kind of uh, mobile or, or modern web um, application out there, whether you like it or not, you actually have an API. There's data and there's functionality going across the wire. So you've got to think carefully about how are you securing that? Um, what are you doing to make sure that that's not open to abuse? Um, and this comes to a really important point. Um, I was talking with a security architect with a big um, credit card company. And he was saying his job isn't um, to make sure that everything's secure and to, to be locked down. He said his job is to provide information about the various risks to the business people so they can make a, um, a trade-off from a position of knowledge. Um, so this is the most important thing, is you don't want to be accidentally making those trade-offs. You want to be aware of what your risks are, what your options are, um, and then make a sensible trade-off. 
because there's this view um, that um, the most secure app is, is an app that has zero features. Um, it also creates zero revenue, so it's not great. The moment you want to start adding revenue generating features, you start introducing risk. Um, and so you really want to be eyes open about um, what your risks are, what your possible solutions are, and then um, how to make that business trade off. And the, the final comment on security is really a theme through a lot of these things, that security is not an appliance. It, it's not a technology that you buy off the shelf, a big system that you just plug in in front of all your other systems and suddenly everything's secure and chatting over a mobile network. It gives you this REST stuff for free. It, it, I just haven't seen that work, but I think a lot of people are exploring the large appliances like this uh, as a solution to security, and it's the same way that the content management systems need to evolve, that security needs to evolve. And the way that security has evolved on the web and for communicating securely and, and keeping you know, personal data private but actually having open access to the, the information that should be public uh, is something that there's already standards that have evolved for the web for dealing with that and that they're the ones that we should be embracing. And the last comment about getting the, your nuts and bolts um, in place is good testing and automation allows you to move quickly and evolve. So I'm a ThoughtWorks developer, so I have to mention testing in every presentation that I give, otherwise I don't get paid. Um, but I really think some people think that when you're exploring an uncertain future, uh, that actually it's not worth investing in good engineering. And, and I really don't think this is the case. That, that actually it's having good testing in place, in, in the right places, that allows you to explore and evolve quickly. And when we talk about automation, we're now not talking just about automating our apps and automating our testing. We're starting to talk about automatically deploying those things to the cloud, monitoring them in the cloud, analyzing what's happening. And we think that that's a major part of this uh, mobile future to the point where we've actually got talks later on this afternoon about how do we actually approach continuous delivery in this space and how do we um, start dealing with analytics and measuring what's going on. Yeah. Just one little point on, on testing there. A lot of people think that testing is just a patch of time you spend before you go live and it takes extra time so it's sort of, it delays you going live and learning. We think if you bring that up front, um, one of the most important questions that, I, that ThoughtWorks people tend to ask is, how will we know when we're done? Um, and that's how do you constrain the work you're doing? And if you're taking this experimental approach, let's say we want a small experiment, put it out there and learn, um, thinking, of, uh, thinking of your tests first, automating them, constrain you to implement just enough to get that experiment out to production. So rather than being an extra time lag at the end of the process, it's something you think about first that constrains how much work you do. Okay, so um, right now you need to follow the money and work, work out where the money is. And I think um, Horace has been um, fairly clear um, on, on where the money's moving. Um, right now, um, in, in the US um, and in Australia as well, um, we think the money's in these places, Android, um, iOS, and the web. Um, we think right now, unless you're targeting Toronto, um, strangely, where they have a big BlackBerry population, BlackBerry and Windows Phone probably aren't worth focusing a huge amount of money on right now. Um, so I just want to help you think through strategies for how you follow the money, because the problem here is each of these different um, platforms require different ways of coding, different technologies, slightly different skills, and so there's sort of a, um, a cost and an overhead in targeting all of them. So um, when we're talking about platforms, um, we're talking about all these different um, uh, type, types of ways of, of getting, to, getting to your users. So um, we're consultants, we like charts, so we're looking at platforms this way, and then we're looking at the quality of the experience. Um, and there's a trade-off between the two. There's a, a cost curve um, that if you want to hit all your platforms with a really high experience, there's a high level of cost um, and time to reach that. Okay. Um, so, um, so one standard approach is to, particularly for a new product, for a new market, um, is to try to get a high level experience um, and write natively for um, each of the different platforms and then roll that out across different, um, different devices. Um, we took this approach with a large bank who had more money than God, um, and even they found some problems here. And it wasn't just the cost, it was actually the flexibility um, of being able to um, adapt. They had different teams, different technologies inside um, each vertical there. Um, there's, there's another approach, which is to try to cover your bases quickly. There's some tools that can allow you to do that, but when you try to um, up the level of experience and functionality on one platform, um, you often hit this glass ceiling. Um, and the strategies we try to look at and the technologies we try to promote are ways of trying to avoid that glass ceiling. And, and two general approaches that we're taking in, in building mobile apps, trying to do it efficiently and so you can get a great experience and not hit that glass ceiling. We're only going to talk about 
briefly, if you, if you want to have a, a, a conversation around how you structure mobile apps and, and natively for iPhone and Android, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation in one of the breaks. But the two guiding principles that we see are, are keep the app simple. That the initial conversation shouldn't be around how do you build multiple apps and how do you share all the logic across them. And actually, how do you build all your back-end systems to keep the app as simple as possible? And having these smaller services, focused services on the back end is a great way of doing that. And once you do have that small bit above the, um, above the waterline, that tip of the iceberg, they're starting to look at how you share logic across them. And, and using the web is a great way of doing that. So j just to give a couple of examples, because e every company and every product has different trade-offs for this. Um, the first one, I'm not going to go into detail, um, but there's a product called Jump In uh, from 9MSN that I've been working on for the last few months. We're about to have a presentation uh, from James Brett uh, around um, MI9 and, and what they're doing in that space. But just briefly, in terms of the, the trade-offs of those technologies that are being made and that kind of um, native, you know, just for the Apple App Store versus the kind of open web approach, that the one side of it on the left is a, a kind of TV guide and it's, it's about uh, performing quickly and having a, a good experience to get through it. And that's all done natively. That's what makes sense to do natively and, and the tools are best for. But on the right, we start to have lots of uh, content fed in uh, around TV shows. So this particular one is about the Today Show. And actually, each of those columns you see on the right is actually all content pulled in from the web. And actually, they're all pulled in from separate um, back-end services. So we're starting to move towards that, that flexible future. Um, I, I won't go into that too much because James is uh, going to talk a little bit about um, more about Jump In next. And so that, that's the nice, easy situation when you're building a new application. But for many people, you've actually got an existing product. You're already somewhere down the line um, of building mobile applications. So I just want to look at one example um, from a major US airline we worked with who were in that situation. Um, they had um, fairly fully featured um, apps across these four different platforms. You could um, book travel, um, um, check in, and do a bunch of other features on them. But they were running out of money, wanted to redesign, and wanted to add new features, but they couldn't do all of that. Um, so they asked us to come and help. So we followed the money and saw that the money was massively in um, iOS and Android for them. So something like 90% um, of their mobile traffic was across those two platforms. Traffic was fairly evenly split between the two, although revenue was massively skewed towards iOS. So we, had, um, so, so we advised them to stop working, in sunset, stop working on a sunset their BlackBerry and Windows um, approaches, and then work out how to bring together, share more logic between iOS and Android. Um, there's an open source project that we'd created before this um, that helps with that. Um, we'll happily talk about that, but actually what's more, imp more important is the approach. And the approach here is to share logic in a way that um, uses an open standard, so it uses web technologies and JavaScript to share logic, but then it gives you freedom to improve the experience and go native if you need to, um, platform by platform and screen by screen. Um, so, and then one of the benefits of that using web technologies was um, they got a mobile app pretty much for free out of that process that managed to help them look after their BlackBerry and Windows customers. Yeah, so the two points here, just the general principles are about keep the app simple and share logic. And part of that is not just a technology solution, but an organizational solution. So traditionally, we often structured the teams around uh, one team per channel. You have a digital channel and a print channel, and then mobile came along, so we have a, a mobile team as well. And really, to get good sharing and, and, and keeping the app simple, this structure is not well suited. And actually, you need to start structuring your organization around having uh, one team per product. And so you can actually all sit together and have that conversation daily around where the effort should lie and how you get that, the unseen bit behind the waterline really working uh, well together. Okay. And so I want to talk fairly briefly about how to evolve your organization to support this way of working. Um, and there's actually a real tension between um, discovering new products, what new product opportunities will work in the new market, and then scaling existing um, products and, and monetizing them. Um, and so there's, there's one mode where you're optimizing for learning, um, and there's another mode where you're optimizing for predictability, quality, uh, revenue, and so on. And they're both valid modes. Um, traditionally, enterprise have been more in this scaling mode, um, and startups have been more in the um, discovery mode. I actually thought, think one of the things ThoughtWorks does is, is straddles these two divides. Um, it sort of teaches startups how to grow up and become more enterprise-like, and hopefully begins to teach enterprises how to loosen up a bit and um, gain some of that um, focus on discovery. Um, so just a, a few words on how you manage teams who are focused a little bit more um, on discovery. 
If you've worked with ThoughtWorks, you've probably seen one of these uh, burn-up charts, tracking scope of what we're delivering against time. Here's what we're trying to deliver. This is the scope. Beautiful team, nice and predictable. Um, actually, if you've seen, if you've worked in reality, your scope changes a bit. So this type of approach is nice. We're looking at um, delivery over time. The graph is good because the important stuff is visible. Um, we've seen scope go up. We realized we weren't going to hit the date, had the tough conversation, brought the scope down to something manageable. But if you come into the more of this experimentation or discovery mode, you get a very different type of chart um, because you're changing your ideas, you're experimenting, you're learning, you're adjusting. Um, and this chart basically makes your managers pull your hair out. And what this tells you is you've got the wrong chart. Um, so actually, you need to think about measuring something else. Um, so, um, and this is important because you've got to really think about what you're measuring. Are you optimizing for predictability or are you optimizing for something else? So just a few thoughts of what to measure. Um, one is cycle time, and this is a measure of the productivity of, or um, the performance of your team. This is rather than saying, when's our full release going to be ready? It's saying, if I come up with a new idea, how long is it likely to take to get that one idea into production? Um, another thought is value. Uh, measure the value delivered rather than the number of features. And this is looking at the performance of your investment. Um, and then a final one is learning. There's a lot that we're trying to learn about Will customers adopt this technology? Can we make it work? Are there security risks? Um, so finding a way to track what you're learning and what you're closing down in the potential product space um, is really important as well. Um, so I, I think we're almost out of time. So there's just a couple of points we want to finish on. We believe that you can have more than a short-term strategy. The, the long-term strategy is less around specific technologies and specific solutions and more about uh, cultural and organizational change that set yourselves up to evolve. And so we talked about being a good ecosystem player. So playing nice externally with the market that's developing, with the commercial and technical entities out there, but also choosing systems and, and structuring your services so they play nicely together internally. Likewise, setting yourself up to evolve, both your architecture and technology and your organization. They both need to evolve together. Um, and then finally, empathy. Um, understand your users and their context. Get inside their heads, get inside their context. You can understand what products are going to resonate with them. Then also have empathy for your internal teams that are trying to deliver this and work out what kind of structures you need to put in place to support them and what kind of metrics you need to use to, um, um, to, to manage and measure what's going on. And in the shorter term, the things to be looking at now really are follow the money. Just invest in the platforms that have the users that are going to give you the biggest return. And you are most likely going to be building apps, whether it's web or in the app stores. And, and you should be doing that. Keep an eye out for the post-app world, that, that this future where that may not be the end solution. So minimize the investment in the shiny front end and maximize your ability to actually respond to change quickly. And as always, get the basics right. And so as we look at this uh, fragmented future, it, it poses significant challenges. But it, as Horace pointed out, the size of the market and the size of the opportunity is greater than ever before. And we think the organizations that begin to evolve and continue to evolve will be very successful in this future. Thanks.